Amen. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Can we give a shout of praise for the moms in the room? We love you. We honor you. We thank God for you. We are going to today cook for you or cater for you. Men, this is where you s respond. We're going to deal with the dog for you today. We're going to take care of the children today. We're going to handle bath time today. We're going to handle bedtime today. The men are getting quieter and quieter. This is how much we need you every day. Because the things that we are about to embark on trying to do today, we do not have the ability to do them every day. My wife told me that if our kids are under 18 and the Lord were to take her home, that I have exactly one week to get someone else in the house to help out. I thought she was joking. She said, the kids are grown, never remarry. But if they are in the house and they are young, you got seven days because on day six and day seven, our house will burn down. I used to be confident in my sufficiency to handle business in the house, and I've just come to the realization that life is way better with my wife. Yeah. Amen, husbands? Anybody got an amen to that one? Yeah, amen, amen. Well, hey, we are uh, in a unique series. I had a dream, and I, I'm going to go ahead and go on the hook and tell you. I've not even got permission from her to do this, uh, but my mother-in-law has one of the most incredible stories of motherhood and what God did through a lot of pain in her life. And uh, last night, I had one of the craziest dreams that we were sitting here sharing that story. And uh, next year, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to do everything I can to get her to come and tell you that story on Mother's Day here. Uh, it's one of the most incredible stories of God's redemption to bring a broken girl from a very broken story out of a holler in TR, uh, unite her with one of the 15 people that were the top 15 most wanted in the United States, and on their first date, send them into an FBI sting operation where uh, he gets arrested. Uh, she gets carted home by police escort. She stays with him through a seven and a half year prison sentence. While in prison, my father-in-law met Jesus uh, from Officer Morgan. My wife is named after the police officer that led my father-in-law and ultimately my mother-in-law to the Lord. And uh, their testimony and their story of how God worked through their life is an incredible thing. So I wish I could share all of it with you. It's that, what were you doing, Russ? Why weren't you thinking about this earlier, Russ? Why are you dumb, Russ, that I, I have to sometimes work through? But uh, hopefully next year we can do that. This year, though, we have been setting the stage because God has been, uh, I believe, building momentum. Uh, we are coming into a season where I, I believe God has been preparing this house, this local church, as a local place of fellowship and for us to belong and to be encouraged and built up in Christ, to take to the streets and to push back the darkness and to be the kingdom citizens and people that God has called us to be. And so we're, we're moving into kind of a, a season shift as a church. Really the first two years of this experiment of you hiring a barefoot guy from California. Is, is he a fruit? Is he a nut? Is he crazy? We don't know. Um, but, but bringing him in, like, like really, I feel like the mandate of the first two years was let's just, let's just learn to love each other again. Let's get on the same page. Let's heal over everything that's happened over the last couple of years together. But, but, but now, as the spirits continue to move in our church, I feel like it's time to start calling on people that are followers of Jesus to get on their boots, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to uh, open their hands towards God and allow Him to begin to use them in areas and spaces where perhaps they have not dreamed that it would be possible for God to do something of significance through them. We believe that Christ is at work in you. That glory is imminently going to come through Christ's work in you, and that it's going to echo in eternity as a praise from you to the throne of God. That is the chief aim. We are consumed with the fact that you are going to stand before God soon. And when you stand before God, we want you to be presented by the work of the Spirit as made perfect in Christ Jesus and equipped having lived a life that has not just lived for yourself, but has lived for something greater than yourself within time. So we've been going through these core values, these values that help us not forget who we are, what we are, and what we are about 
as a local church. It's easy to have a good mission statement. It's easy to make goals every single year. But the difference between those of us who write down a goal or a mission statement and those who see the achievement of those goals in those mission statements is an ability to stay focused with good habits and values that keep us focused on not getting distracted from the main thing. Simply put, the question that you should probably ask yourself seasonally is, is the main thing still the main thing in my life? Or are we beginning to drift? right? Is the main thing the main thing? Are we prioritizing things rightly? Is Jesus really preeminent in my life? Is he really first? Does he really come before my wife, my kids, my job, and everything else in my life? Or is that just lip service of something we know we're supposed to say, but in reality, Jesus is anything but first in our time and in our passion and with our affections and with our energy? Is Jesus first? Is your spouse before the kids? Or have you begun living a life that prioritizes running the kids around to where you become roommates with the spouse? You see, God has set us up with an order that honors him. It's God first because out of your relationship with God, you find everything you need for everything else that comes in your life. But for a lot of us, the order gets out of whack. Sometimes, to be honest with you, it's easier to love a young child than it is to love a, uh, at times, frustrating spouse. So what ends up happening is your affection begins to wane from your spouse and pursuing them and you begin to prioritize the kids or prioritize the job where you can get a quick win or an easy win or you can find success a lot easier there than you're finding in your marriage. And as a result of it, you end up in a cycle that's misprioritizing a life and misses the main point. Are you tracking with me? So today I want to teach you our second value. Our first one is we lead with Love. We believe that if we want to be a church that reaches the least and the lost and the lonely with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is our mission, that we will have to be a church that leads with love. How do you lead with love? The quick thing I I threw out there last week is you've got to be love. You cannot give love that you don't have. And the first place that we are to go for love is not to another person or a relationship or an achievement or a success that we can find. But it starts with us going to the Father who has demonstrated his love through the Son by sending him to die in our place, to live the life we couldn't live, to rise in victory over the death that we deserve to die. So that now through Jesus we know that we are loved and received. Not in a transactional future promise of we'll get better God, we'll improve God, we'll earn it God kind of attitude. But instead. Instead, the kind of love that says, I loved you before you loved me. I loved you before you ever promised anything to me. And my love is not dependent upon your promises that you give me in order for me to give it to you. You see, this is the beauty of God's love. He can't love you any more than he already loves you right now. He won't ever love you any less than he loves you right now. He just simply loves you. He loves you. And when you know you're loved, it opens up your hand to extend his love and to love him back. So if you want to be a person that leads with love, you got to be loved by God. Because by the love of God, you're then able to love God. And then whenever you love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, there's this crazy thing that begins to happen. You start loving people that you didn't love before. And you don't know why. You start getting patient with people that you've been impatient with before. And you don't know why. And it comes from... The fact that you've been loved by God, that's turned your heart to love God, that's now filled your heart with the love of God so that you can love your neighbor. If we want to reach the least, the lost, and the lonely with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you are like, man, I wish I didn't come last week for the 50-minute version of that. (laughs) If If you want to be a person that reaches the least, lost, and lonely with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got to lead with love. Number two, our second value today is if we want to be a people that reaches the least, lost, and lonely with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got to live open handed. We've got to learn to live open handed. Some of you are thinking, oh gosh, is this a money talk? No. (laughs) You would wish it's a money talk by the end of this. (laughs) Money is an easy thing to be open handed with. God's after so much more than earthly finances. He's after every aspect of your life. And the idea of living open-handed is not living open-handed in an area, thank you. It's an idea of you living open-handed towards God with everything. When you have God, everything else becomes negotiable. Everything else. When you have God, everything else becomes negotiable. What does that mean? That means we need nothing but Him. 
this is why I constantly harp on this idea of being desperate for Jesus. In the Old Testament, there's a term given to the people of God. In the book of Leviticus, they're called pilgrims. They're passing through. This is not home, so we don't cling to it tightly because this is not what our aim in life is. It's not to build structures and kingdoms on this side of eternity, but it's to represent a kingdom open-handedly that's to come on the other side of eternity. For a lot of us and a lot of preachers, this is lip service, but I believe it's God's intent that right now you would leverage every bit of whatever you have in temporal time for what matters in the kingdom to come on the other side of it. This is the Christian way. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. To be someone that is open-handed to God with anything that he puts in your hand. So there's never a moment where he could ask you to extend it through your hand. And in greed, you would close your hand around it instead of extend it for his honor and for his glory. You see, this, this sermon attacks the false sense of security many of us have in a lot of broken things. It attacks the false sense of security you can find in your country. It attacks the false sense of security you can find in your bank account. It attacks the false sense of security you can find in human relationships. It attacks the false sense of security that you can find in self-sufficiency, gifts, achievements, and abilities. It goes after and asks the question, is your real trust fully resting in God as your provider and as your Lord and as your leader? Or are you in some subtle way taking gifts that God has given you and closing your hands around them and building your life on them? Created things are not rocks to be built on. They are not anchors that hold you in life's storms. No matter what it is on this side of eternity, moth and rust destroy it. Bodies break down, abilities diminish. In the words of the prophet Toby Keith, you'll find yourself one day not as good as you once was. <laughs> Therefore, we are not to build our lives on our achievements and accolades, on the economies of the world, are the constructs of a government. We instead have been set apart to become a people that belong to a king before we ever identify ourselves with an earthly kingdom. And to live open-handed towards that king to where if he doesn't come through, we will be ruined. That is the Christian way. That's what God dependency looks like. It's on him in everything, or he's not worthy of anything. So we, we believe that if we want to be the kingdom people that God has called us to be, that it will require us living a life that is absolutely open-handed and dependent upon the provision, leadership, and lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me unpack this to you a little bit in a, in a text. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, we get this idea of open-handed living as Jesus sends out his disciples for the first time. Look at the text with me. Verse 5. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. So they're going to be his ambassadors. They're going to be his representatives. But he gives them some guidance. When you go... Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Now, we need to mark this point of time. We need, we need to quickly just note that in just a few books over to your right, there's a book called Acts. And when the Holy Spirit comes, they're told that they are going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. But prophetically, the gospel was to be preached to the Jewish people first. Essentially, what we see in these first two verses is a call to go and call for the prodigals to come home. To equip the prodigals to come home, to come in, to be filled with the Spirit at the day of Pentecost, to be the witnesses that would go to the nations, that would share the gospel, that would uh, carry the good news of the Messiah's coming to the entire world around them. <clears throat> it got crazy in the championship game yesterday. I yelled too much. <clears throat> Thus, I'm suffering. 
So, so the idea, the idea was that the ministry would start with those who were a part of the family of God, but had strayed. God was getting his house in order before he sent the house to go and fill it with others that hadn't heard of the good news. You see, before going to the nations, the call first starts to those who were already part of the house. But for various reasons, they had wandered, strayed, stopped looking for the Messiah, stopped expecting a move of God within the temple, and had wandered away from faithful obedience with the Lord. So he sends the twelve out to the prodigals and says, come home, come home. I, I believe genuinely that this church is in a season in what's been known historically as the Bible Belt. And let's just be honest, it's, it's, if it's not Texas, South Carolina is the buckle of the Bible Belt. And I believe God is calling us right now to build the house up so that the house can be sent out. Now before we've got good news to share with those who are lost in the darkness... There are many who have been walking back and forth between light and dark, between absolute passionate pursuit of God and apathetic indifference towards God in and out of those seasons over and over for the majority of their life. And I believe God in this season is uniquely through his word grabbing prodigals, bringing them home, putting his robe of righteousness on them, filling them with the Holy Spirit, founding them on his identity, moving them from a religious aspiration in their words about God into a white-hot, passionate pursuit and dependency on God. And he's taken the things that have been overlooked and dismissed, and he's now positioning them to be platformed for his glory and his honor and his praise. This is a season in this church where God, I believe, is reinvigorating the passion in the hearts of many of you who believe God for great things but wandered away because it took too long to remind you that God is not a man for which he should lie nor a man for which he should boast that what he has whispered in the dark you can proclaim from mountaintops because if God spoke it he will do it and he will not end until he has finished everything that he has said and desires to do in your life and so the call to the twelve is to start by going and getting the prodigals that's where we've been Go get the prodigals. Go get the prodigals. What have we been seeing over the first 20-something months of uh, us getting to do this together? We've seen a lot of people coming back that went away. That's where the church has been. A lot of people making a comeback whenever they had wandered away. Verse 7, Jesus sending the 12 out says, Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is... It's near. This doesn't hit in a lot of our hearts because we've been around the sun enough to begin to wonder if he's really going to fulfill it and make it happen. How much does eternity really weigh in your heart in your day-to-day living? I mean, c- consider this. How many of you re- really believe that Jesus is coming back? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> how many of you are living as if it could be now? You see, th- this is the tension. There is a gospel urgency that is to accompany. Not, not a hurriedness, not, not a worry, but an urgency that gives a clarity that goes, you know what, you know what? We are going to bet the bank. We are going to bet the farm. We are going to leverage all of our time and all of our affection in the priority of Jesus being preeminent and first in whatever way and in whatever direction he desires for our life to go. And and we're going to leverage it because we want to be found by the work of the Spirit and the grace of Jesus faithful at his return. How many of you are truly living as if the kingdom of heaven is near? Here's what he says. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Uh, Many of you followed the revival that was going on at Asbury. What you don't know is what didn't make the camera. What didn't make the camera at Asbury, talking to many of the professors that were there, was the amount of people that were coming in that began to manifest demonic stuff. How many demonic deliverances were going on in the back prayer rooms of Asbury? 
You know why they didn't want cameras there? Because this was not to be promoted or, or thrown out there as like, oh, look, salaciousness stuff for us to watch on the news and get a kick out of. It was not meant to be made into a documentary that would elevate people over the God who was delivering the people who were in bondage to slavery and sin. Most of God's work is done unfilmed. I can get more done in obscurity than I ever get done in notoriety of the news. I pray we never make it to the news of public media. My prayer is that we are unnoticed but wildly effective in the ministry that God has called us to do. He gives them orders. They are to go out and pronounce this message. God's kingdom has come. As a part of it, they are to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and drive out demons. Now, for a lot of us, we, we read that, and then we like to theologically juke ourselves into uh, dismissing the likelihood or the probability of the more extravagant works of God in the Bible happening. We, we break up into camps, and we debate it, and we like to sit around and like smoke pipes, drink beer, if, if you're in that some party, and then we like, we're like, okay, so, you know, this can't happen now. Uh, why can't it happen? Because this happened, and that, that means this doesn't happen anymore. And I'm, I, I'm just going to be honest. If you don't believe that God's still doing the things that he did in the Bible, just go to the international mission field for a week, and then let's talk, Thunder. God still heals. God still raises the dead. God still cures the incurable. If you do not believe it, do not think that your American experience is the encompassment or the entire uh, story, the entire story of what God is doing. God is active and at work doing amazing and miraculous things. And for many of us, we want to spend time, all of our time, on the question of what did or does it take for something like this to happen today. But I just want to submit to you that this is not the question that we should be asking. Instead, I believe the right question we should be happening is what does it take for something like this to happen? In a place like this, in a people like us today. Not can it, but what does it take? What does it take for something like this, in a people like this, to happen today? That, that, that's what I want you to see in the text. What does it take? He says, go and announce, heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy. Verse, uh, verse 9, he goes on to say this, don't take any money in your money belts. Money is not what gets you in the door for kingdom work. Money is how you get an audience with everyone. I was informed of a business owner that's opening a business here. He's really in with the people in the White House. And so there's someone from the White House potentially coming down for the grand opening of the building. Why? Because there's enough money going through that building into the pockets of people in the White House that the people that have authority up there want to come down here and cut the ribbon because they're good old boys and good old friends with the person that's running the business. Your money will not get God to show up. Your money will not buy his authority to back you up. At the end of the day in God's kingdom, it is not money that advances it or money belts. It's not gold. That's what a lot of us break our backs and spend our lives for, to get a gold watch so that we can watch all the time we've misprioritized and waste, waste on our wrist. Then you get to heaven and you realize God paved the streets in this stuff. Mine's not gold, but you, you get what I'm saying. There might be gold in it somewhere. It's not gold that makes a move of God happen. It's not copper coins, verse 10. Don't carry a traveler's bag. It's not planning that makes a move of God happen. How many of you are the person on your vacations that you have a checklist before you get in the car, you have an itinerary once you're on the vacation, and you have a pack list as you're leaving the vacation. We love you. We try hard to love you. <clears throat> we appreciate you. We need you in this world. You make sure that we don't wear dirty underwear. You, may, you make sure that we get our teeth clean so we don't get heart disease. But there's no amount of planning that can prepare or cause a move of God. No, no, look, look, look at what he says to them. Don't, don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality. 
See, this is the problem. This is the problem. You don't need money. You don't need planning. You need an authority. You need an authority that can get you in the doors where you don't know you're going to walk through. You need an authority that's before you, ahead of you, at work before you ever got to wherever you're going because you don't actually know exactly where you're going. So, so, so the authority is not money and the authority is not plenty. The, the authority is you need a name that is greater than your name. So ultimately, if you're going to do kingdom work and if you're going to live a life that's open-handed, you've got to have an authority that's Jesus' authority. You see, the story starts in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve, and they are called to, to, to lord and steward, under the lordship of God, the entire creation. They're given free reign with what God gives them to steward it in a way that honors God or dishonors God. They choose to surrender with the volition that God has given them, the opportunity to reign and steward the creation that God puts them in, and they pass that stewardship over to the enemy, to Satan. We trade the divine privilege of stewardship, and as a result of it, receive the slavery of sin. But the good news is, Jesus comes, having us given up our authority, to restore authority where it was taken. After Genesis, the ruler of this world... Uh, is a statement that we'll see in Scripture referring to Satan repeatedly. We were made to rule the world for the glory of God under the lordship of God. We then cede that to Satan. And then we read in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, a few hundred years before Jesus ever comes, Isaiah 9, 6, it says this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the will rest on his shoulders. He is coming to be the authority over the authorities. And there will be no authority, if you read the book of Romans, that will exist on earth that will overcome or usurp his authority in the end. You see, it's prophesied that the government would rest on his shoulders. Then in John chapter 12, verse 31 to 33, <clears throat> it says this, The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate that he was going to, this is how he took the authority back. Your sin, my sin, required the life of a perfect, blameless sacrifice. No amount of sheep, no amount of goats, no amount of whatever we could do would ever climb the hill to God. So God came off the hill to us. It's what we celebrate every Christmas. He is Emmanuel. He is the God-man. He came as fully God and fully man. And he lived the life that we couldn't live. Died the death that we deserved to die. And now as a result of his resurrection, he has given us a victory that none of us could have achieved. And an authority that none of us could have received apart from the work of what he had done on our behalf. So much so that after his resurrection, after 40 days of appearing to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, all, uh, all authority has been given to me. Now, now we, we read this, and we're comfortable with Jesus taking the authority back. But here's what he does. He gives it back to you. The church has been neutered. Because we don't understand that Jesus' work was so that the Spirit of God would come in you. His authority would go before you and it would mark you and it would give you the ability to do the work that you can't do in and of yourself. You are meant to be weird. You should not make sense to this world. The same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is at work in you. You. Yet for many of us, we live powerless existence because we don't know the authority that God has given us and has called to mark the lives in which we live. You see, in this text, Jesus is sending them in his name and in his authority into the world to be his witnesses. For us to do the work of ministry, it must be done in both his name and it must be done under his authority. Now here's what happens in church world, really quick. <clears throat> we start hearing about authority. People get nervous because we're greedy, we're arrogant, we're prone to wonder from God. And a lot of us that like to pound our chest about having the authority of God are some of the most arrogant, prideful, godless people I've ever met. We're building our kingdom and not God's kingdom. So we jet around on our private jets because God wanted us to have it. 
So we build our big fences and our big houses because God wanted us to have it. And instead of being marked marked by the fruit of the Spirit, we're marked by the fruit of a satanic televangelist on TV, and we have no middle ground in between. What's missing is a group of people like you and me who have been given the authority of Jesus' name to go and push the darkness back in our community who don't do it because we we have bad examples of people who don't know the authority or don't want to deal with the authority that God has given them or they, in greed, seize it and demonically twist it for their own self-interest and self-good. You have authority. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have authority to steward creation for his glory, to mirror what is to come in the kingdom to come in the life that you live now. If you're going to be a people that see the kind of move of what God did in this text in Matthew chapter 10 happen in your life, it will require you walking in the authority of Jesus, number one. Number two, it will require you depending on his power. If you're going to do the work that Jesus did, you need his authority. You need his name. That gets you in the door. But you need his power once you're in the door. Look at the text. It goes on to say this, uh, verse 11. Whenever you enter a city or village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. Okay, this is weird for us, but here's the deal. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you're to carry the Holy Spirit everywhere you go. And when you are at rest and surrendered to his peace, there is something that people cannot, it's not tangible to them, they cannot figure it out, but there is something different about you. In the hallway, I was just talking to one of my favorite people. God this year has done something incredible at D.R. Hill. I know that D.R. Hill gets a lot of crap. I know that D.R. Hill's like like, uh, uh, the brunt of jokes for a lot of people, but what we've not been paying attention to is the fact that 100 plus students weekly have been gathering in a gymnasium, some of the most dysfunctional and broken kids, and God has been working on that campus through saints that, look, look, who chose who chose to be kingdom people instead of retreating and running out of the door. I'm so proud of, of, of the people that have been a part of that. I, my, my point in bringing it up is they have been experiencing the power of God and the work of God. And look, look, and, and, and I don't have to say who they are. You go, you go to the school and you're like, hey, who's different around here? And their name just pops up over and over again. You'll hear it every time. I can't go more than a couple of weeks and they're like, oh, you go to church where that woman goes? Yeah, oh, you're blessed. Oh, we know. We know we're blessed. (laughs) There's this intangible thing whenever you're surrendered to the Spirit where He begins to bear His fruit in your life. That begins to push back darkness and give hope to the hopeless in a way that you can't understand. So you carry this blessing with you that you can extend when you're surrendered to the Holy Spirit. The problem is carnal Christians who are not dependent upon the Holy Spirit can't bless any household because all they can give them is more fruit of the flesh. You see, the world is cursed with sin, and God put his spirit in you so that you would push back the curse with his blessing, with his peace. Oh, this frustrates some of you. This is what you've been called to do. Look at the text. If it's a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it's not, take back the blessing. If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake the dust from your feet as you leave. I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day. I saw a TikTok this week, I don't, I don't have a TikTok, but I saw one, and it was a young man that got approached by a, an adamant atheist, and he was yelling, he's like, how can you believe in God, how can you believe in God? And the kid, humbly, calmly, and powerfully spoke the gospel in less than two minutes to him, could have been more than 16 years old. And after he spoke it, the guy started ranting and raving and yelling at him that he was lying again. He said, look, he said, one last thing. I love you. I have communicated the good news to you. And I am no longer responsible for the day of judgment that's going to come against you because you did not hear and you did not turn. 16 years old. I know preachers that don't have the gumption to speak that kind of truth to people. 16 years old. Our, Our job is not to deliver the revival. Or deliver the harvest. It's to be the faithful worker in the field. Our role is to sow the seed. Our role is to be the bold witness. It's not arrogant. It's not bullhorning. It's not picketing. It looks more like washing the feet and the muck of the world off of those that are around us and in our neighborhoods. It's done more in obscurity than it's on a platform. 
Look at verse 16. Look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. But be aware, for you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips and in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and, and kings because you are mine. Mine. Think about this. Pete, and I think it's uh, Pete and John, they get beaten. And they come out of the beating going, huh, how awesome was that? They did it to Jesus. They did it to us. Woo! Dare you be so lucky. Dare you be so lucky that you get real persecution and not social media persecution. Dare you be so lucky. Some of you think getting banned on Facebook and shut down is bad. Oh, good Lord, just get off of it. Like, like. Verse 19, when you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what you will say. Why? God will give you, God will give you the right words at the right time. That's the power. You got the authority that gets you into trouble. When you stand before the rulers that they thought were there to condemn you, he then gives you the power of what to say to them. If you want to see a move of God, You've got to live open-handed and dependent upon God. That means you've got to have his authority and you've got to have his power in your life. The text goes on to say this, for it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. That's the Christian life. It's not what you do for God. It's what in surrender God does through you for himself. But God doesn't work through closed hands. Every dime. Every accolade. Every child. Not mine. Yours. Every job. Every bankruptcy, every disease, not mine, yours. This is the idea. See, some of you, you're burdened and broken because you're carrying your pain. And the pain was always meant to be cast on him. <laughs> See, we, we like to withhold in our minds the good things from God, so then we don't think that we can bring the broken things to God. But the beauty is, the Christian way is dependent on God, under the authority of God, and by the power of God, being open-handed to God, so that he can do with your life and your time and your affection and everything, whether it's good or bad, whatever he desires. So for some of you, you need to turn the disease over to God. Because there may be something that he's going to do through it that you've not perceived to be a possibility yet. For some of you, you need to turn the job over to God. For some of you, you need to turn the son over to God. Turn the child over to God. Turn, turn the promotion over to God. Tur turn your desire for elevation over to God. Turn the marriage over to God. We need Jesus' power. We need Jesus' authority. And if we're going to see a move of God, we need Jesus' presence. Jesus' presence hmm. says, verse 21, a brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one town, flee to the next. I tell you the truth, the Son of Man will return before you have reached all the towns of Israel. Skip over 18 chapters to the right. Jesus says, I've got the authority. I'm giving you the authority in my name to be my people and to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. But I will be with you when you lose your spouse and you're alone. I will be with you. When your kid goes prodigal and you have no hope that they're ever coming home, I will be with you. 
when you stand for me and you are ostracized and rejected, I will be with you. When you sin and you hurt others and they give up on you and they never come back to being a conduit of grace towards you and everyone else has given up hope, I will be with you. You, If you want to be a part of a move of God, you're going to need the constancy of his presence in your life. You see, the whole key of this text, I believe, goes back to his call in verse 8 where he says this. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Freely (coughs) you have received. Freely as the people of God who now are possessed by God. Freely you give. You see... In ministry, we are to operate by more than business sense. We are to live dependent on the provision and the power and the presence of God. The nemesis of God dependency is the guise and comfort that that can come through a false sense of self or material dependency. It's all rooted in greed, which none of us in this room are, so good news. Don't need to pay attention to what I've been saying. Since no one's greedy, that's what you call it pastoral sarcasm because I'm greedy and you're greedy and that creates a lot of havoc when it comes to being the people of God you see a a life that knows God but does not fully entrust itself to the care and leadership of God will always find itself taking things from God and using them for their own greed a life that knows God but does not fully entrust itself open-handedly to the care and leadership of God, will always take the gifts of God and use them for their own greed and self. You see, this life of greed, it's a life that closes its hands around the blessings of God instead of extending his blessings through their hands. It's a life that chooses to make it all about earning rather than about receiving from God and extending it to your neighbor. But let me just remind you, God won't bless and fill closed hands. You want a new life? Then give up your old one. You want a new season? Then surrender the last one to him. Start being a steward and stop being an owner. You see, I want to make sure you understand this message. Living free in this way requires you to understand that there's a lot of traps you can fall into. For the godless, they believe they're the owner and they're the steward of their life. For the selfish christian they believe that they're the owner and god is the steward of the life it's my life god you owe me i do this i pray this way you give to me what i want for the lazy christian the trap that they fall into is that god is the owner and steward of my life and i don't have to do anything what the bible teaches about this ministry that we steward that we're to be open-handed to his lordship and leadership in is that god is the owner and i am the steward of what God has given me on this side of eternity. God's not asking you to steward what's not in your hand, but the question is, with what's in your hand, are you stewarding it for his glory? Are you open-handed with it for his name, for his renown, and for his kingdom to come, and for his will to be done? In Duncan, as in heaven. In Woodruff, as in heaven. In Spartanburg, as in heaven. In Gur, as in heaven. In Sugar Tit, as in heaven. Saint, you have been saved by his blood. You have been raised by his spirit. You have been given his authority. You have been filled with his power. And you have been called to be his people. In this city and all of the neighboring area. For his glory and for his name. May you live open handed. So that as he fills your hands, his kingdom will come and his will will be done. On earth, not in spite of you, but on earth through you. In Jesus' name. Our prayer team's up front. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. You move as the Lord leads. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's respond.